Welcome to another episode of Faithfully Podcast, the flagship podcast of Faithfully Magazine, owned and operated by Faithfully Media. In this episode, Managing Editor Nicola A. Menzi speaks live with author and public theologian Dr. Christina Cleveland about her latest book, God is a Black Woman. In God is a Black Woman, Cleveland shares her painful yet liberating journey of confronting what she calls white male God and recounts how she learned to embrace the sacred Black feminine. She introduces readers to a Black female God who is the complete opposite of the oppressive and controlling God fashioned and favored by white patriarchal Christianity. Let's listen. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining this Faithfully Magazine live author Q&A. Uh, I'm your host, Nicola A. Menzi, Managing Editor at FaithfullyMagazine.com. And today we are talking with Dr. Christina Cleveland about her new book, God is a Black Woman. Uh, in addition to being an author, Dr. Cleveland is a social psychologist, public theologian, and activist. Uh, she's the founder and director of the Center for Justice and Renewal, as well as its sister organization, Sacred Folk, which creates resources to stimulate people's spiritual imaginations and support their journeys toward liberation. An award-winning researcher and former professor at Duke University's Divinity School, Christina lives in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, in God is a Black Woman, Dr. Cleveland shares her personal journey of dismantling the cultural white male God and uncovering the sacred Black feminine to, in to introduce a Black female God of hope, healing, and liberation. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Cleveland. Thanks. It's fun to be here. All right. Uh, so to jump right into things, um, God is a Black Woman is obviously far different from your last book, which was almost 10 years ago, I believe, um, Disunity in Christ. Um, so I'm wondering uh, if you could kind of and, you know, tell us uh, who was Christina Cleveland then? Maybe who and what was she then? And um, who is Dr. Christina Cleveland today? Hmm. Huh. Well, when I wrote Disunity in Christ, I was pretty firmly entrenched in this idea that I was a reconciler and that reconcilers are bridges and bridges get stepped on. And so I thought it was my duty and my calling and even a pathway to faithfulness or, or holiness for me to do everything I could to try to bring people to what I, what, what, what might be called a reconciliation table, even if that meant being trampled myself. So I was usually a really, really, really focused on honoring the dignity in other people. And it hadn't quite occurred to me that my dignity was just as important <laughs> and that if my dignity was being trampled in the process of justice, then maybe it wasn't justice. Um, and so, you know, I think Disunity in Christ is a beautiful book in a lot of ways. I'm, I'm one of those proud authors who has a love hate relationship with their earlier work. I think that's pretty normal. Um, if you're, if you're thinking and growing, it's pretty normal to be like, mm, I'll redact some of that. And also there's some of it that I like, and I would maybe adapt for today, you know, and so, um, but yeah, I was a different, I was a different person. I'm, I'm a bit of a late bloomer in the sense that um, because of my family um, of origin and the very conservative Christianity I grew up in, it took me a while to find my own truth. Oh. And so Christina now, <laughs> um, similar in some ways, very passionate about truth telling, still fiery, still interested in pushing the edges of, um, of what we can be as a people, as a society, and also um, a very different Christ that I relate to now, a very different um, divine figure. And now I see myself as sacred first and foremost, and my work flows out of that, and my, my theology flows out of that. Okay. All right. And uh, we've already dropped these terms, of course. Um, so I'm just going to ask you to define them real quickly so that everyone is on the same page. Um, for example, when you say God is a black woman, what do you mean? Hmm. Uh, literally and figuratively, <laughs> I mean that God's social location 
is at the intersection of Blackness and female, and that God can relate to my personal experience as a Black woman, and that anytime you encounter a Black woman walking on this earth, you are encountering a divine one. And I also mean that God is a Black woman in a more cosmic sense, that um, Christ shows up in Blackness and femaleness in the ways that we and that, that those terms are really representations of Christ or like my, I remember James Cone says, my blackness is the image of God in me as a black person, you know? And so I say God is a black woman in that way too, that God's blackness and femaleness is the image of God in black and female women, people. Yeah. Okay. And closely related to that, what is the black feminine divine? Yeah, yeah. And I use the term the sacred Black feminine a lot in my book. And that's the broader, um, so um, that's the broader kind of grouping of divine beings that can exist inside or outside Christianity. I, I, the Black Madonna is an example of that, a Black Virgin Mary. Um, but anytime God shows up as a Black woman, it's standing with and for Black women, that's the sacred Black feminine. So it can, so she exists in Hinduism in the form of Kali. She exists in Buddhism in the form of Tara. She exists in um, Judaism in the form of Shekinah. And so you see her showing up kind of like a universal Christ figure who's Black and female. Okay. And finally, who is white male God? And for those of you who have not read the book or read anything about the book, uh, you present white male God as, you know, otherwise we'd say, oh, that's three words. No, but you present it as one word, white male God. Who and white what male God. is yes. white male God? God? All one word, all lowercase. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no respect for white Zero male respect. God. <laughs> um, I call white male God the patron, the patron saint of white patriarchal religion. White male God is the belief system that confers holiness, sacredness, dignity, worth, and value to people if they conform to white maleness. And so white male God kind of like the sacred black feminine shows up in different iterations. White male God shows up in white Jesus. So that's a very like blatant form of white male God, but white male God also shows up in much more subtle forms. Like the fact that it says in God, we trust on the dollar bill next to a white male, George Washington. A white male God shows up in the fact that in the history of the Supreme Court, we've never nominated a black woman because black women are as far as possible as you can, as far from white male God as you could possibly be. Therefore, black women are not seen as sacred. And so white male God sort of determines who's sacred and who's profane. And the more you approximate white male God um, and or contort yourself into something that's acceptable to he and his minions, you will get access to some of that holiness and sacredness and value in our society. Okay. And um, I guess to jump into some of the more personal, although this is a personal journey for you, you know, uh, from top <laughs> to bottom, but you know, there you spend a lot of time in the book talking about your, you know, your upbringing as a kid and how your family shaped you and, you know, the church you attended shaped you. And, you know, some of that stuff, Obviously, it was, you know, difficult to read. Um, and I can't even imagine, you know, the perhaps the trauma and the pain linked uh, to some of those memories. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, if you could talk a bit about how your upbringing, how you were shaped and molded to kind of see the world and, you know, see the divine and understand your relationship with divine, the divine. Um, I don't know, kind of eventually brought you to that place of conflict where you could see with clearer eyes um, maybe the damage that had been done and things that needed to be changed. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm a unique, well, no, I'm not unique. I think I'm like a lot of um, 
black people who grew up in the United States and they, we live lot, we live in lots of worlds. We might live in black worlds, but we also live in white worlds, multiracial worlds. Um, and so I spent a lot of my time in growing up in the black Pentecostal church. And I spent a lot of my time in the white evangelical church. Um, and one of the earliest memories I have at church is being called a nigger by my white um, VBS teacher, vacation Bible school teacher. And um, I remember as a five-year-old, like feeling shame, not understanding the word, but knowing it was bad and knowing that it was about me. And that it was, and it was about the fact that my skin color was different than all the other little boys and little girls. And so early on, I mean, little Christina had a sense that this space that's supposed to be a safe space, can't, it can't always be relied upon to be a safe space. And it's because of my Blackness that I'm not safe here. Um, and unfortunately, you know, which I think is the case for a lot of folks, um, some of the messages that I got in the church um, were pretty consistent with the messages I got in my home. And, you know, it certainly was a moment of, um, grief when I realized that I'm not necessarily safe from white male God in my own home. And as I started kind of recounting some of my memories growing up, but my parents um, were really young and had been raised in pretty constrictive religious um, spaces. And so they handed down some of the same ideology of white male God that I was hearing in the evangelical church. And I mean, this part is not just about like the whiteness of God's skin or the maleness of God's body. It's really the like white patriarchal notions of hierarchy, of top-down leadership, of like hating the body, fearing the body, um, elevating the mind and over like embodied experience. Um, and so there was a lot of that that I was raised in in my home. And one of the things that we were taught was that um, need was not okay and perfection was not okay. And we were punished pretty harshly for in, what in retrospect I now understand to be just kids being kids, um, kids working out their emotions or kids working out their questions um, and their needs, but maybe not being able to express them as eloquently as, you know, a Yale educated adult <laughs> might expect from another adult. And so, um, yeah, I, I was taught very much as a child that I needed to be afraid of my own humanity. And the, because of these experiences, both in the home and in church, that were also connected to this sort of distant God, this father sky God who didn't really like me, but sort of was so loving that he put up with me, but he also sort of had to sacrifice his son in order to even justify putting up with me. And I needed to like contort myself into the best possible version of myself, according to his exacting standards that I would never be able to meet in order to get good things in life. And so I was introduced to this God who was terrifying this white male off planet father sky God who really didn't want anything to do with my black female body and uh, was interested in only dominating me so that I could do, do acts in service of him. And, and I, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Are you finished? Um, well, I wasn't sure if you, well, I mean, I can talk about the turning point too, but if you have a follow-up question, no, no, go ahead. Cause I was also thinking as you were talking, um, like, you know, I don't know exactly when things started shifting for you and you started questioning things, but I remember it was kind of like a, a, a shock, I guess, or a surprise or people weren't expecting it. It made like headline in like Christine media, right? Dr. Christine Cleveland has left Duke divinity. Um, and so I'm guessing there was something going on there. That was another point. Yeah. Maybe. Later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think the first time I really started talking publicly about my shifting spirituality was in 2018 when I went on my black Madonna pilgrimage. And, um, I had been, you know, churning for years before that in internally, um, but that was the first time I just sort of started sharing my journey with people. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this is what I'm thinking about. And this is, I'm going to visit these black Madonnas, which like, I mean, I grew up in Protestantism. So not only is the black Madonna Catholic, but she's like the sketchiest of Catholics. 
Catholicism, you know, like we were just taught that Catholicism wasn't Christianity and that, um, and so I think just it being interested in the Black Madonnas turns some heads for folks, but then also, um, sorry, interest in Catholicism or these, these relics within Catholicism and then the Black Madonna in particular. Um, and then, yeah, I think, you know, as part of that journey, I did end up um, leaving my position at Duke Divinity School because um, I eventually encountered myself in the divine and felt too sacred to be working on a plantation that wasn't designed to... Um, help my work flourish. Um, but really backing it up just a bit for, for your community and for readers who, um, who might be coming to the book. You know, I really, um, a huge turning point for me was right around when, when Disunity and Christ, my first book came out nine years ago, because a uh, few things. One, mm -hmm. Trayvon Martin was killed about 10 years ago. And that was a huge wake up call for me and many black millennials. Um, when I saw the way the people who claim to be my family, both as colleagues and also as church member, fellow church, mem church congregants, when I saw the way that these white people and non-Black BIPOC people were responding to this national conversation, so the first time we're having a, a national conversation about race, probably since Amadou Diallo in 1999, you know, so this is like, and I was like, just out of high school then. So this is the first time in my like adult life where everywhere you turn on news, there's some sort of conversation about this. And just seeing the way the church and also my academic colleagues, and at that time I wasn't in a, I wasn't in a Christian academic setting, you know, but just in seeing the way they responded to that, that really started waking me up to the problem of white Christ. And I started speaking about that. And I started writing about that in 2015. I wrote a piece about that for Christianity Today magazine. And so I was already starting to really interrogate some of these assumptions. But then I think the next big piece for me was the, Me Too, the, the hashtag Me Too movement, the hashtag Church Too movement, and then also Donald Trump getting elected. And I think for me as a Black woman, particularly in these like Christian justice spaces, I always had to choose, am I going to care about being a black today? Or am I going to care about, care about being a woman today? Because the white Christian women's movement is the worst. And then the multiracial justice, multiracial church justice, racial justice movement is very male dominated, very misogynistic. I was often the only woman who shared the stage at these big conferences. And as I'm walking up to the stage, I have men telling me, I actually don't even believe that you should be up here, you know, speaking with us. And I'm like, thanks for the vote of confidence as I literally take the mic, right? And so I was always split. My sacred black feminine embodied soul was always split. And so I kind of just set the women part aside. I'm like, let me just focus on white Jesus because I can't even like I, it, and that's when, you know, when Trump got elected, that's when I was like, oh, wow. Like I know Trump's racist. And I know Christians aren't going to care about that because Christians are racist. Cause I wrote a book called disunity in Christ and all I got was hate mail and racist people. So no surprise there, but when Trump, Trump started going after white women, I was like, okay, they're going to do something, right? Like, I mean, I think we all thought that. Like, this is finally right. it. Like, and it's like, oh my gosh, what? Like, even their precious little white women aren't sacred? Then we got a big problem. We got a problem with not just the race of the divine in America, but the gender of the divine. And so that really is what was a huge turning point for me. So like 2016, um, of course, I didn't really start talking publicly about it till 2018. Um, but the wills were really churning already. And I was making some pretty significant um, changes in what I was reading and what I was thinking. Okay. And so, all right. So there was a whole series of events happening over years and years and it all just kind of added up and eventually, so what was like, I don't know, is there a key defining moment where you're like, all right, you drop the ax and you're like, this is it. I'm gone. I don't want to be well, a part yeah. of this world anymore. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, well, there were several in 2015 okay. and 2016, okay. you know, and I, and I, and I talk about a lot of them in the book in the section called severing my careers as Christianity's house nigger. There were many events right in, in succession where I just saw, I was starting to wake up and I was just seeing, I'm just literally being, I'm a mascot. I'm being exploited. Like these people do not care. Um, and I was becoming, I was becoming aware of that and I couldn't, I couldn't, unsee it um and so that and but yeah so I think that was a big turning point just that sort of disillusionment realizing um yeah like there's a huge difference between what people see as this person who's on these big stages and what's actually happening behind closed doors um and then I'd say the next big turning point was when I just started looking for images that were not of 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 black female divine and I within an instantaneous moment of encountering a picture of the black Madonna, like my entire biology changed. <laughs> and I yeah. realized I've been holding my breath for maybe my whole life. Wow. It was like wow. the biggest exhale. I'm still feeling the reverberation of that exhale, you know, where it's just like, oh my gosh, I'm sacred too. Everything I thought I knew needs to be reexamined. Mm. Um, yeah. So, um, I guess to really drive it home, uh, who are white male God's favorite people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the paradox, right? Like wh- I think white male God hates us all. White male God is inherently anti-human and white male God disg- is disgusted by humanity and life. I mean, white my God hates the planet, hates birds. Like, how do you hate kittens? You know, I'm not even a cat person, but I like kittens. At least, the, right. you know what I mean? Right, right, right. <laughs> and so, I mean, no one, although our social structure is designed so that we're all clamoring up this ladder to try to get the so-called life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness that white male God keeps dangling in front of us. But... You know, I have, I mean, the people who are closest to white male God have access to the, to the most of his goodies, right? So if you're white, you're male, you're cisgender, you're heterosexual, you're middle class or higher, you're formally educated, which means you have some college education, you're American, you speak English, you're able-bodied, you know, all these sorts of things. You're Christian. Um, if, even if you're that guy, your life still sucks because you're constantly in this capitalistic, competitive, anti-nurturing world where your worth is entirely dependent on your conformity to these prescripted rules. And I remember having a conversation with one of my most, I mean, well, at Duke Divinity School, I'd say like half my colleagues were like famous. All my colleagues were famous in their little world, their little academic worlds. And then half of them were just like straight up famous, like just always on TV, like always speaking at these huge conferences, big books, that kind of stuff. And I remember talking to one of them who's like up, like super famous. And I caught him in a moment of just like, uh, honesty. It was like late at night. We were just talking in the hallway and he was just like, yeah, like the reason why I'm here at like 11 p.m. or whatever is because I'm afraid that if I don't keep producing, that I'll become irrelevant and I won't like maintain my status and I, and I won't be like a valuable person in this world. And I was just like, you, you feel that way? If you feel that way, then like there's no hope for any right. of us. You literally <laughs> are white male guy. You know what I mean? Like, right, 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 right. Yeah. Like, you're winning in every way we're taught to win and you still feel insignificant. And that's the thing. Like it's a resource scarcity trap. We're all trying to be part of this tiny, terrifying circle of acceptability. And we're so busy trying to be part of that world that we don't even stop to ask ourselves, do I want to be in that world? Do I even like the people in that world? Because that world's associated with goodness, with holiness, Mm -hmm. with going to heaven for, for people who believe in hell and are afraid of that, you know? And so it's very, I think it's scary to just stop and be like, wait a second. Why, why do I, you know, I remember like, um, you know, uh, um, so many people back in, when I was back in the evangelical world, there would be so many black people who would just be like, I really want to get a seat on like the board of the national association of evangelicals or something like that. And I'd be like, 
Why? You don't even like those people. They're whack. They're not making decisions that are for black people. And if you did get a seat at that, you, it would just be a token. Like, it would mean nothing. And it's like, yeah, we're just too busy. And I feel the same way about my decision to go to Duke. Okay. You know, it's like, oh, it's an opportunity. It's a bigger stage. I'll have more resources, all that stuff. I didn't ever stop. It wasn't until I got to Duke that I was like, how exactly does one do reconciliation from the plantation? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. how exactly does that work? And I want to ask you a bit about, too, like, you know, going back a bit to, like, the family upbringing and the things you were experiencing as you started um, thinking more deeply about how wrong, I guess, some things from your past was. Um, how was the process of writing the book? Because I know it took you, I think, a couple of years and, you know, you're doing this pilgrimage also um, and you're also working through some of these memories and trauma and trying to get it on the page and reliving things, perhaps. So how was the whole process for you of getting that right. all down on the paper? Yeah, yeah. Living that stuff. Yeah, this is definitely one of those books that's like, um, yeah, it's like it's, it's been a life work. You know, it's it's taken up a lot of my my space, both socially, relationally, spiritually, and professionally. Um, yeah. So, in addition to the five week walking pilgrimage across central France, I, um, you know, I, I think um, the real work was writing it. The real work was taking these encounters that I had on this this pilgrimage that were really transformative, encountering these you know, sacred black feminine images of God that are just super ancient and super artistic and breathtaking, really. Um, I knew even as I was walking those 400 miles, like, Christina, you have a choice. You can either make this like a super cute trip. And at that point, like my trip had nothing to do with the book. It was just like, it was just, I'm on this journey for myself. I want to see these Black Madonnas. I was still working at Duke at the time, so Duke paid for the trip. So I was just there enjoying my my life. And um, I, I was like, I, this could be a super cute trip and I can have all these great journal entries, or this can be something that actually changes my life. But if it changes my life, it's going to be because I went back home, back away, you know, out of La La Land of pilgrimage, you know, where everything just feels so like connected and clear and mm -hmm. integrated with my life. And so this, as I came face to face with these 18 black Madonnas and encountered myself in the divine, I had to say, okay, if, if I really believe that God is a black woman, and if I really believe that I am sacred as a black woman, how is that going to change my life back home? How's I going to change my relationships with shady white people that I probably should have fired a long time ago? How's I going to change my relationship with my parents that's still really governed by hierarchy in a way that's not honoring to me or really them? How's that going to change the types of speaking engagements I take and the types of jobs that I keep? And I even knew in 2018, you know, I, it wasn't until a year later that I actually left Duke, but I knew at, on that pilgrimage in late 2018, like, yeah, I'm not, I can't stay at Duke long-term. I need to start figuring something else out, you know? And because I needed to untether from that capitalistic model. Um, and so the writing of the book is what enc encouraged me to integrate the book, to integrate the ideas. And that's part of the reason why it took about a couple of years to write it, because I maybe it wasn't maybe it was like a year and a half but um there were often times like when I'm writing about like my body and the sacred black feminine I was like yeah I can't write this with integrity without going and doing some more work on this I'm going to set this chapter aside for months at a time and circle back when it feels authentic um and so there were lots of moments like that are you like you know I um I can't with integrity write this without having this conversation with one of my beloveds because this conversation speaks directly to what I'm talking about right now. And I've been putting it off, but my sacredness demands it, uh -huh. you know? And so there were lots of experiences like that. So it wasn't just leaving Duke. That was a big part of writing this book, but also 
leaving a lot of things and then taking up new things. Yeah. And one of the things too, I I, uh, would love for you to comment on a bit, you know, um, the whole deconstruction thing, right. Um, And when you reconstruct into something that, you know, is liberating for you when you're living your best life and, you know, you don't feel like you're under this gaze of this terroristic white male God and you come back to, you know, quote unquote, the real world from your pilgrimage. And you mentioned it a bit in the book, you know, about possibly, I don't know, your relationship with your family, who's so important to you, suddenly maybe perhaps being severed. Um, you know, so was that like a real concern for you that, you know, the possibility because oh, you're terrifying. on your own oh, spiritual terrifying. path now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why people don't leave plantations. <laughs> it's really hard, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. it was hard for our ancestors. It's hard in modern day plantations. There's so many reasons for us to stay. And um, a lot of them are good reasons. You know, we love our family members. We feel connected. We have history. Um, Black women in particular are very collectivistic and our identities are often very connected to our families. And that's a beautiful thing. And it was it was so important for me to realize that my commitment to myself had to be as strong as my commitment to other people. Um, but yeah, it was absolutely terrifying to have those conversations. It was terrifying to make to make adjustments in those relationships. Um, and it was terrifying to see them change in ways that may not ever, like we, we may not ever regain the perceived closeness, the felt closeness. I don't think that in a hierarchical um, relationship, you can actually have intimacy. I think it's a felt intimacy. You know, um, so I think that's something I grieve is just that I've never really had that sort of intimacy that some people can have with their parents where it's not just hierarchical, especially as people grow into adulthood. But, you know, as I grew into adulthood, the hierarchy did not change. If anything, it got even more entrenched in my family. And there's some some examples I give from my 20s. Um, and I could give examples from later on, too. But I was trying to keep it just a little bit when I was younger. Um but yeah, I mean, just like making changes and standing up for yourself. And that is comes with a real loss of, well, things aren't the same. And we don't have this like cute, chummy relationship that we used to have. And we don't, we don't have the same language to talk about, to, to, you know, we don't, we, we don't speak the same language. Um, and it kind of reminds me of, um, and I think I mentioned this earlier in the book, like how when, you know, Harriet Tubman would threaten people people who chose to try to escape with her, she would threaten them. Don't go back. You can't go back to the plantation. And I kind of think of it that way. It's like, once you are on your journey, it's going to, the relationship's going to be different. Even if you're still in touch with that person, you're not going to be living the same life that they, that they're living and vice versa. And you're going to, it makes sense to grieve that, you know, I think I imagine enslaved, my enslaved ancestors grieved, so many things about what they left behind, including relationships and certain, and a sense of certainty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Loss can be expected. So not just, you know, the professional costs or whatever the communities we know we're used to, but uh, family loss can also be a big Uh, part of it. mm -hmm. Um, And so I want to uh, touch a bit on the, your tour, your pilgrimage in Southern France and, you know, you being on the run from the law, I'm just kidding. And, uh, just like the Black Madonnas you encountered. Maybe you can talk yeah. about one or two. And yeah. the one you kind of connect with the most that you feel really mm-hmm. affirmed by that, you know, feels like sees you and is for you. Yeah, I mean, they all do. They're all so magical. Um, and I, you know, I think I talk about maybe eight or nine in the book, although I went to see 18. Um on that particular program. <laughs> right. um, so I don't have a favorite, you know, cause of course it's like, uh, you know, which, which of my kids is a favorite, you know, but um, the one that I keep returning to the most in the chapter that I've read in my book, the most, <laughs> the most often is I believe chapter five, which is about she who cherishes our hot mess. And that's the black Madonna of Vichy 
France, um, which is in central France. And she's called Our Lady of the Sick officially, traditionally, but I call her She Who Cherishes Our Hot Mess. Um, for some reason or another, um, I keep returning to her because could be my personality. I don't know if you know the Enneagram, but I'm an Enneagram one. And so like, it could just be personality and the fact that I'm a perfectionist. And, but I think it's also this growing up in this white male God world where dominance, perfection, needlessness are markers of humanity. And even in, you know, the, the run up to this book launch, like, so the book came out like almost a month ago now. And there are just so many pressures towards your book only matters if you're dominating the market. Your book only matters if you're getting the most important interviews. Your book only matters if there are, if no one has any critiques of it. You know, so again, that perfect, the perfection, the dominance, the, you know, like in and, and just being okay with saying, like, oh my gosh, this is super stressful. I'm kind of falling apart here, <laughs> you know, and being honest about that as opposed to everything's great and I'm so hopeful. And I, you know, it's and so it, there's just so many messages we get in our society that it's not okay to be human. And so I keep returning to she who cherishes our hot mess, who knows what it's like to be decapitated, who knows what it's like to have her head separated from her body because that happened to her too. And the people tracked her down when she was stolen during the French Revolution. And at that point, her, her walnut head was all they could find. And so they built her a walnut body and pieced her back together. And so just this idea of like me, this human being who's been decapitated by this white patriarchal world that just wants me to perform and wants me to turn off everything in my knee, everything in my body, all need, all messiness, all blood, everything. It's just so powerful for me um, to be reminded that it's my need that's my special offering to her that she cherishes that more than anything else. Um, and so that's just an image of God that's just so stark in contrast to what I grew up in, grew up with in the church, and then also just like the vibe in our world. Yeah, yeah. And um, that we can lead with our need and we can be big and loud and messy with it. And that's okay. And that in her, we can find communities of people who will cherish our need as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so she's pretty powerful for me, okay. even though I love them all. <laughs> all right. I just want to take a moment here for our viewers just to remind you all, um, if you have any questions for Dr. Cleveland about the book, about her pilgrimage, about the Black Madonnas, um, just drop it into the chat and I will pass it along to her. OK, so any questions you have for our guest, Dr. Cleveland. Drop it in the chat and I will pass it along. Um, all right. So just winding down a bit, Dr. Cleveland. Um, and you kind of mentioned this in the beginning, how, you know, Black Madonna is like a, a Catholic thing, so to speak. Um, yeah. But what are Protestants missing out? And re closely related to that, because this is the path you took. Um, it is. Is this, you know, the path toward embracing the Black feminine divine? Was this just the way for you, Christina Cleveland, to get free? Or is this the way for all of us uh, mm. to get free? Both. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's my journey. And I think, you know, one of the goals of my book was to write my story and then um, hopefully give people um some sort of inspiration to write their own story and to find themselves in the divine. And so I don't necessarily think that like everyone needs to um, go on the exact same journey as me and, and make the exact same conclusions as me. Um, and also really the sacred black feminine is probably the only, that is probably the only thing that can heal us from the ills of white male God. <laughs> Cause she's the complete, opposite an antidote to who he is. And when we truly see that all women and all black people are sacred and we're really truly as a society committed to the liberation of all women and all black people, that will liberate everybody because the systems of domination that would have to come down in order for that to happen would set us all free. And so I think 
this journey, this particular journey for me to the Black Madonnas um, make, makes sense given my background, give, first of all, my racial gender background, but then also my Christian background. You know, the Black Madonna is just one example of the sacred Black feminine. I don't think it's a surprise. As a social psychologist, I, I'm not surprised that the, that the image of the sacred Black feminine that I first was drawn to was the one that was the most familiar to me. Even though it's Catholic, it's still Christian. And I mean, the Catholic Church doesn't exactly own the Black Madonna, and she certainly exists outside of the Catholic Church as well, but she's most associated with the Catholic Church. And, you know, we we look for what's familiar, we look for what feels safe, you know, we're taking our little baby steps into the forest, and we want to see, you know, what what feels good, um, and what feels, um, yeah, feels comforting. But she's just a portal, you know, and she connects me to, I mean, the Black Madonna, and um, or, or Zuli Dantor and like Haitian voodoo, they're the same. And so there's so many other iterations of her in other religions. And so I think people can find whatever path makes sense to their spirit and to really, and, and that like, sort of makes sense in, in the context of their spiritual language as well. And so I guess it would also help to clarify for some people, because, you know, I've read reviews and reactions, I guess, to your book um, and the material you share. And I mean, and I also read in one review, you obviously don't um, describe yourself like as a Christian, right? In the traditional sense or in the sense you would have maybe like 10, 15 years ago. Um, So, I mean, what label because you know labels help us understand things like uh, how should we understand your spirituality now and what are some of your practices because I'm guessing you're not going to necessarily um, you know like Sunday morning church in the typical environment and doing whatever the practices are, are there so what are your spiritual practices right now how do you connect to the divine how do you worship the divine and um, what labels, I guess, would help us understand uh, your faith right now? Yeah. um, Well, I certainly would say that I'm connected to my Christian roots. Um, I think I'm like um, one of my ancestors on the Hush Harbor, in the Hush Harbor. I'm someone who's harvesting the most life-giving elements of Christianity and mixing them with other spiritualities that affirm my sacred Black feminine soul. Um, and that was pretty common on the plantation as well. So I don't think it's like really different from traditional African-American religion. Um, I don't know that I have personally not called myself a Christian. I think Christianity's kicked me out. You know, I think people have said that. Um, I don't really feel strongly either way, you know, but, um, I do, I do attend a church that is a part of like, um, a, 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 traditional Christian denomination. (laughs) Um, So I am, I do participate in their worship services. Um, But I also love, I mean, I'm also a member of a Buddhist Sangha. I also love to practice um, spirituality that would probably, you know, things that I've learned when I lived amongst Candomblé priestesses for a while and things that I've learned in other contexts. So somewhat interspiritual, but also just no, like naming that, I don't want, even even if I wanted to completely extricate myself from my Christian roots, I wouldn't be able to because I'm a social psychologist and I understand that like we are, we are non-consciously formed and like, (laughs) but I, I don't think I would want to either because I think the, the sacred black feminine is so interested in weaving and healing and weavers and healers take what is and make something beautiful out of it. And so throwing the baby out with the bathwater is not, um, that doesn't feel life giving to me either. (laughs) Okay. All right. And uh, we do have a viewer question here uh, by Douglas Law. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, He says, how has uh, the author, Father Richard Rohr, influenced your spiritual journey? If at all. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I, you know, there was one key moment that I can think of um, when Richard Rohr's teachings and writings really impacted me. And that's when, and also uh, Matthew Fox, who's written similarly, 
um, about when, you know, when he was talking about the universal crisis, this is actually years before the book came out because the book is fairly recent, but, um, you know, years ago he was talking about the universal crisis and just helping, helping me and helping readers to, um, to make a distinction between Jesus and Christ and how Jesus was someone who showed up in one particular space and history and religious context versus Christ, who is, I would just call universal love. And that, and so that helps me connect a lot more with the ideas of Kelly Brown Douglas, for example, um, the womanist theologian who says, you know, Christ is a black woman, whenever black women are showing up for our community, you know? And so this idea that Christ is universal and can take on all sorts of bodies and shapes and spaces. And Jesus is one example, an important example of the Christ, but just one. Um, so that, I think that was huge for me in setting me free from the essential, uh, the essentialist sort of Jesus is a man, Jesus is Jewish, Jesus is all these things, um, and s- separating that from the divine. Okay. All right. And so if, you know, someone is, you know, they're having this internal struggle, they're starting to question things, um, what would you recommend as like a good first step to maybe start answering some of these questions that are popping up within? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think the answers are, if they do come, they'll come after a while and they may not come. (laughs) And so, um, you know, I think, you know, my, my deconstruction journey led to reclamation, but not all deconstruction journeys do. And so I think if you're, if you're going to go down that path, um, getting comfortable with ambiguity and getting comfortable with um, feeling alone. And I'm not sure that you always are alone, but it feels that way when you're starting to ask questions that no one else is asking. You're starting to take steps and explore in ways that people around you aren't, especially in like very insular Christian communities. Um, I think my, my, my best sort of lived wisdom would be connect as much as you can with whatever abundance looks like to you. I think um, white male God really traffics in resource scarcity and fear. And there's so many, I mean, there's so many reasons why we don't even start to ask the questions that our souls are longing to ask because we're afraid. And so for me, connecting with abundance was huge. And that was like, literally like doing self-compassion practices, going for walks in nature, reading scriptures that remind me that I'm unconditionally loved, even if that's not what I, even that's not the message I get from the established church, these like actual scriptures that say, but you are beloved and I will never leave you or forsake you. And um, those sorts of things just to, just to give me the courage to step off the plantation and just asking a question can feel like stepping off the plantation. And I think a lot about Harriet Tubman, our ancestor, who I think a lot about that, the time period between when Harriet Tubman woke up as an enslaved person and was like, "Mm, I'm too sacred for this. And then the actual time when she left, there was probably a whole incubation period (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> where she was gathering up her connection to abundance. She called it the North Star. She said, keep your eyes on the North Star, right? But gathering up her connection and her trust in a divine source that was going to guide her as she walked into the unknown, because we'll never, ever, ever know what we're walking into. We can't read enough. We can't plan enough. We can't prepare enough for taking that step. It's just impossible. So the question is, how can I connect to my North Star? How can I connect to abundance? So that when I do step off that plantation, all hell may break loose, but at least I can keep my eye on something that anchors me. All right. All right, great. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Um, And I just want to say, you know, I enjoy reading God is a Black Woman. It's challenging in all the right places. And of course, you know, it's heartbreaking and provoking uh, in other parts. And um, I just want to say for people watching, because I feel like I might have lost a couple of Twitter followers, too, because I was so enthusiastic about the book. And, <laughs> you know, there are even a couple of comments. It's like, you know, people were adults. Right. I appreciate the book for what it is. I don't fully agree, of course, with everything that's in the book. And that's not the purpose. Right. But it challenges me 
and it gives me life in certain aspects and inspires me to start asking certain questions and considering certain things. So people do not be afraid to pick up the book, please. I, I think it will richly bless you. Um, and, you know, if you are provoked to start asking certain questions and going down a similar path, maybe, you know, that is for you and this is the book you need. So anyway, I want to th thank you, Dr. Cleveland, for taking the time to talk with us. Uh, thank you for your very powerful book, God is a Black Woman. Um, it's much needed today. Your voice is much needed today. Um, so I want to thank you and thank our guests. Also, yes, I see Sue Rucker also says thank you for sharing. Um, That's wonderful. So, absolutely. And, you know, any parting thoughts at all? I mean, you've already said so much. Um, so, but if any parting thoughts, anything you want to know for viewers who maybe want to keep following your work and, you know, stay connected with you? Sure. Yeah. I, um, we have a newsletter. If you just go to my website, christinacleveland.com, you can sign up for our freedom journal where we're just continuing to ask questions that connect us with our sacredness and liberation. And yeah, it's a great way to just stay connected. It's bi-weekly. So just twice a month. All right. Excellent. So we'll end it on that note. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, to this Faithfully Magazine live author chat with Dr. Kristen, Christina Cleveland, author of God is a Black Woman. All right. And we'll also make this recording available at a future date on faithfullymagazine.com. So thank you, everyone. Enjoy your Saturday. Thank you for listening to this episode of Faithfully Podcast. If you enjoy this episode, consider subscribing to the show via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. If you'd like to join Faithfully Magazine and its mission to keep Christian media diverse, consider becoming a Faithfully Magazine partner subscriber. Partner subscribers, or FMPs, enjoy full access to our exclusive content and so much more. Just head to faithfullymagazine.com to learn more.